morning. Welcome to worship. It's an exciting day. Every Sunday is an exciting day. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a little bit together. We're going to worship together. We also celebrate Father's Day today. We thank you, all who are fathers or who are like fathers. Um, we have a little gift for you in the back. So if you want to take a moment and grab your little gift, it might keep you awake during this sermon in a bit. There is also, back by Henry, a little um, crib, toy crib, for the baby bottles. Today is the collection of the baby bottles for the um, pregnancy Care Pregnancy Resource Center. So if you have one, you can just place it right in the back. There's quite a few announcements in your bulletin so take a moment and read the bulletin and also in your bulletin is a tiny little envelope and those are for the extra offering that we take twice a month um, during during the offering time so if you have that you can read about it in your bulletin let's begin lord we set an intention right now to begin our corporate worship that we've begun worshiping you this morning we pray for your spirit to be ushered into this room, into your sanctuary. Pray for our hearts to be still. Pray for our hearts and minds to be open to you. And Lord, as we get ready to prepare ourselves for communion, remind us of how you created us. Remind us of what the table means for you as our Father, who have lavished love on us. Remind us, Lord, of the wonderful ways that you have created us. Now, Father, we give you our attention, we give you our heart and our mind and our spirit for you to move and to convict, we pray. Amen. Once we were far off, but in union with Christ Jesus we have been brought near through the shedding of his blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please rise for the call to worship. Because of the Lord's steadfast love, we will enter his presence. May the Lord lead us in his righteousness and make his way straight before us. Please open your hymn book to hymn number two, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain.
where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Outnumber the grains of sand. 
morning I wake, I am still with you. thank you that you loved us enough to send him to die for us on the cross and that he followed your will Lord thank you that you chose to try and redeem us to offer that to us for we are your creation Lord you know us when we were in our mother's womb you cared for us you know all the hairs on our head thank you for your wonderful love 
great creativity in what you have made us. Lord, we praise you through your Son, Jesus, in his name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll take the morning's tithes and offerings. And uh, there's a separate envelope for the Deacon's Fund offering.
We're going to go into our prayer time in just a moment. In our other church today, our former church, um, they're doing a commissioning for mission team, and the team is leaving on Wednesday. So they always do this big commissioning like we do here. Um, Marin's going to be on that team, so she leaves. She leaves here Wednesday morning and flies to Nicaragua for two weeks. Of uh, We've been trying to get her used to the heat. And next Sunday, she'll sit through a two-hour worship service. So when you think the sermon goes a little long, <laughs> think about Marin next week. So we're going to pray for her in a moment. Um, baby Jace, slated to come home hopefully this week. Chest tube is out of him. So they are slowly giving him some formula to see if the fat stays in, doesn't leak out. Um, what else? Jean is home, recovering. There she is. Look at her back there. I'm looking at your seat. Wonderful. Who says hip surgery has to keep you down? And Bob Miller is uh, recovering. Uh, he's in rehab at Porter. Porter Rehab in the nursing home section. So we'll lift him up as well. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for what you do for us, um, what you display in us, what you allow us to display for you, Lord, just this wonderful example of love and mercy. And as we've sung about already today, how you have considered us um, worthy enough to die for, that you loved us, that you have made us wonderfully and fearfully with intent and intention, that you knitted us together, not in a haphazard way, but placing in us our gifts and our, our flaws, perhaps our weaknesses, our strengths, all the things that will reflect you in powerful ways. So today, Lord, as we celebrate you, remind us of our connection to you as our creator, as our father, as our sustainer, as our redeemer, as our savior. Help us to be shaped more and more each day to reflect you. Lord, we pray for um, all the places in this world where we go to proclaim you. We lift up to you the mission team that will be heading out to Nicaragua, that will be ministering in the rural areas and working with um, a group of people teaching and building and helping to educate medically. We pray for their safety. We pray for you to guide them and to change them. Uh, even those who have gone year after year after year, we pray for your mercy and your, your ability to teach them something new in that area. Lord, we pray for baby Jace. We continue to lift him up and ask that uh, if this week is the week for him to go home, that you will align everything that needs to be aligned that you will allow Julia and Chris to come back and allow him to be healthy, to grow and to prosper, to, to grow in wisdom and favor with men and stature. Lord, we pray for uh, Jean's recovery continuous, even though she's here and, and clearly uh, strong. We pray for just that bone to, to mend. We pray for Bob with his knee recovery, for him to be able to move without pain. And Lord, we pray for um, our community. We pray for a community that is, is dealing with opiate addiction. We pray for a community that is feeling the effects of, of that addiction on um, all aspects. We pray for those who are sitting here right now in pain, whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional. And we pray, Lord, today as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, that you would move us not from a, a place of um, pride to shame, but that you would convict us, that you would allow us to, to come before you in a posture of humility, to be able to confess the things that we need to confess to you, to know, as we have said in our psalm already, that you know every part of our being, that we don't hide anything from you, Lord, and that your goal in in dying for us was to redeem us and to change us so that we don't have to stay as we are. So, Lord, uphold that to us today, we pray. We ask all these things in your name. So we pray the prayer you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among, one, among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In your bulletin, it, it lists that um, a Sunday school class is gonna be starting July 2nd. I wanna talk to you just a moment about that. The Mark Sunday school class continues through June, and then in July, we're going to begin an eight-week class um, on spiritual gifts. It's a class by Dr. Uh, Stephen Hawk. He's the person who created Stephen Ministries, if you're familiar with that. And the Spiritual Gifts Inventory is an, is an eight-week class where we unwrap our spiritual gifts. And so if you're sitting here going, I don't really need that, I already know my spiritual gifts, my response would be, pray about it. <laughs> See if God wants you there. Because um, part of the class is not just figuring out our spiritual gifts, but doing the work to figure out what does that mean. And it's not a class just to get people signed up for jobs in the church. It's, it's how do we use our spiritual gifts throughout the whole world? How do I use it in my job, in my home, in my life? So if you haven't signed up, just let us know because we need to buy a workbook. So we need to order those this week. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, now we come to a time of teaching, a time of your word. Pray for you to illuminate it to us today. Amen. So last week we began a sermon series called Making Room for the Incarnation. And we unpacked a little bit last week about what the incarnation is. And that's the time when Jesus walked on earth and God took on skin. But there's another incarnation that happens without the big T-H-E in front of it, and that is when Jesus Christ moves in us, lives in us, and that makes us incarnational people. So last week we had some challenges as to what happens when we become incarnational people. How do we overcome some of the challenges that may pop up along the way? And I gave you a little challenge homework in going to God and asking God where he wanted you to be intentionally planted. Where did he want you to pitch your tent? You may already know that. But if not, it's a great check-in with the Lord. Where do you want me to be incarnational? So today we continue with the narrative, but shifted just a little bit in John's Gospel, and today we pick up the story of John the Baptist. 
not to be confused with the John who wrote the Gospel. John who wrote the Gospel is usually ascribed to a disciple of Jesus. We believe that because of the eyewitness accounts in his word. John the Baptist was somebody different. John the Baptist was a person who had a very specific call on his life. He was to be one of the forerunners to Jesus Christ. He was to point people to Jesus Christ. He also was perhaps one of the best examples in the New Testament of what it means to be incarnational. He understood in our modern vernacular the, dis the difference between the incarnation in Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah, and what it meant to display God through him. He knew very, very clearly where he ended and the work of God began. So for us to look at what it means to be incarnational, today we're going to look at what it means to tell our story. And we're going to look at John telling his story. You've already heard Alan read. The preface to this chapter says this is the testimony of John the Baptist. And through that, we're going to get little glimpses of how we can tell our story in order to help facilitate the gospel. So we're going to dissect our passage in just a moment, but first I want to refresh us on John the Baptist. John the Baptist we hear about for the first time in, in Luke's Gospel when his mother, Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, cannot have a child. By the way, whenever in Scripture you see a woman who's barren, red flag, that child is going to be a big deal. And so we know Elizabeth being too old to conceive means that John will be a big deal. He has a special birth announcement, not as grand as Jesus, of course, nor should he, but he has a birth announcement where the angel of the Lord comes to Zechariah, his father, in the temple. Priest Cohen's would have one week service duty in the temple, and Zechariah is scheduled for that service. And when he's in the temple, an angel of the Lord comes to him and tells him Elizabeth will get pregnant. But the plausibility with that possibility is too much for Zechariah, and so he pushes back and questions the angel of the Lord, which results in him being mute until John is born. He talks as soon as John comes out, and they all want to name him, of course, Zechariah, little Zechariah, and he says, no, 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 his name is to be John, because the angel of the Lord has already told him that. So John the Baptist grows up, and he has this amazing sense of self. John the Baptist has this understanding in the most pure and honest and godlike way we can have it of the difference between what he's supposed to do and be versus who he's supposed to point others to in God and ultimately in Jesus Christ. But John the Baptist is a little weird. He's actually a, a lot weird. He is. He has taken himself out of conventional city life. He lives in the Midbar, the wilderness. He dresses in this camel-haired tunic with a belt. And I remember as a kid, you don't, I don't know, maybe all kids don't really, I didn't really think that was that weird until I started studying what they wore when I was doing my doctorate. Nobody wore a belt. Men did not wear a belt. I don't even know a modern equivalent to compare it to, but you did not wear a belt in the ancient world. Your tunic was linen, and it was gathered in a different way. That was a very disarming um, and, and humble thing to wear that belt. Why does he do it? I don't know. But he doesn't just wear a camel hair tunic and a belt. He eats wild honey. He eats locusts. He's kind of outside the box. He's a Nazarite, and he's been a Nazarite his whole life, which is also outside the box. He never cuts his hair, he never touches alcohol, and he has this ability to draw people to him. John, in every sense of the word, knows who he is. He knows what he's called to do. He knows what it means to be incarnational. He knows how to be effective to point people to Jesus Christ, which leads it back to us for just a moment. Do we know that about ourselves? Do we know our story? Do we know our testimony? Do we have a very strong sense of self, not in a modern or postmodern understanding of higher self, but do we understand where we end and God begins? 
If we're to be incarnational people, this is going to be done in two ways. One, through us as a body of believers and community, but two, as an individual. And if you're going to embody the incarnation for other people, then you have to really understand your boundaries. You have to have a really healthy sense of interpersonal relationships. You have to understand how to communicate and how to talk and how to work with, and you have to have a posture of humility. So here's some questions that are going to be on the board through the duration of the sermon. There's a slide. Suspense. So some questions to ask ourselves. You don't have to write these down because they'll be on the board the whole time or on the screen. Who are you? It's a question we're going to get to in just a moment that the Pharisees asked on the Baptist. Who are you? Do you know who you are? Uh, what is your source of identity? Can you name that clearly? How should your sense of who you are before God as a Christian shape how you live and what you do? We sang a song that my worth is not in what I own. There's one line in there that says, my worth is not in name or title. Do we believe that? Do we live that? Um, are you comfortable with telling your story to others? And not just the how I got saved part of your story, but your whole story, everything about your life. And there's one more slide. And then the next is, oh, I'll add those extra questions. Um, the next one is, how do we relate when we're challenged? When we're criticized, when people come up against us, does that change our story? Does it change the posture of our story? We'll see that with John in just a moment. Have those questions be going through prayerfully your mind as I continue to preach. Let's get back to the word. If you open back up into your gospel, there's a change that takes place in this narrative in verse 19 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19, all the way through chapter 12, verse 54, is this 12-chapter section where John makes a very strong case that Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, he is the one everybody's been waiting for. In chapter 1, verse 19 through 51, the rest of chapter 1, and we're only going to cover part of this today, so go home and read the rest, John the Apostle is unpacking identity statements that John the Baptist has made about himself. And those identity statements are from last week's sermon. Last week we did chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and focused on verse 14. But if you go back to verses 6 through 8, a passage that is very familiar to us every Christmas time, you'll see those three identity statements. John the Baptist says, I am not the light. I am pointing people to the light. And you are not supposed to believe in me, as John the Baptist, but through me, you are to believe in him, Jesus Christ. So then the rest of chapter 1 unpacks those identity statements. Verses 19 through 28, which we'll hit today, unpacks the identity statement, I am not the light. Verses um, 29 to 34 unpack the statement, I am to point you to the light. And then verses 35 through 51 show that John has people through him believe in Jesus Christ. Verses 35 through 51, the disciples start to come to, to John the Baptist, and they're most likely his disciples first. But he gets out of the way, and he points them to Jesus, and they become Jesus' disciples. So we're going to dive into our passage um, in just a moment to look at what it means to unpack. We're going to unpack this 19 through 28. Very specifically, what does it mean to not be the light. Okay, before we get there, let's physically and mentally dive into our passage. Imagine you are John the Baptist. So imagine you're John the Baptist, and you are the son of a priest. And instead of going after your father's tradition and being a priest, and getting the customary robes of the priest and the customary position of the priest, you are called by God to preach with no real formal training out in the wilderness. A very different message than the establishment in Jerusalem. You don't set up your ministry in Jerusalem. You set up your ministry out in the wilderness. And yes, you decide to wear these weird clothes. 
you've got camel hair tunic, you've got your belt, you've got long hair, you've got a, a personality that greets people when they arrive with the opening statement, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee the wrath to come? So you've had more than one person in your life telling you maybe you should soften the approach, John. Maybe you should go with a little more of an intro. But it's working for you. Because thousands of people are coming out into the middle of nowhere and they're being baptized and they're repenting and they're confessing their sins. And then all of a sudden one day, these nice dressed big wig fellas from Jerusalem, the establishment, the religious big dog show up on your turf. They pull you aside and they say to you, who are you? Who are you? And if you didn't know who you were, you very easily could be challenged by that and become defensive and defend who you are. But you know very clearly who you are not, as well as who you are. And because you're sure of your calling and your identity rooted in God and pointing people to Jesus Christ, you are able to outline for these guys who you're not and who you are, which leads to this point. If we're going to effectively point people to Jesus Christ, we have to emphatically in our bones know who we are not and know who we are. And yes, we're going to start with the negative today because that's what John starts with. So turn back to our passage in verse 20. John the Baptist begins with who he is not. These guys show up, and they immediately, according to John the Apostle, ask him, who are you? John the Apostle reads into that, look at verse 20, and he's assuming that they're implying or asking directly if this is Jesus Christ. Is this the Messiah? Why? Because messianic expectations were rising high. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, it had been promised that there would be somebody righteous coming in peace. What is that passage we read every Christmas? That the government will be upon his shoulders? That this person, the Son of Man, the Son of God, would take on the establishment as Rome and free the Israelites. Persecution is high. Poverty is high. Death is high. It is a terrible way to live. And so the religious are looking for a person who's going to step into that place. And John seems to fit the bill. John is outside the box in every sense of the word, and he is highly critical of the government. John's preaching against sin will point out Herod Antipas' choice in marriage, which will eventually get John beheaded. So this looks like the guy. But what does John say to them? Emphatically. No. Look at verse 20. He says, um, he did not, this is John the Apostle, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. By the way, it's as if John the Apostle is an eyewitness to that, because he's able to tell us emphatically what he says. And of the things that the religious elite asked John who he is, the most emphatic is that he is not Jesus Christ. He is not the Messiah. He knows where he ends, and pointing people to Jesus begins. But there's a little bit more as to why they would want him to be the Messiah. There is no grid at this point for the Messiah being born fully human, fully divine, in a manger, and the first people getting that birth announcement to be lowly shepherds and wise men who don't even practice the faith. So these people are looking and searching, and this guy seems to be the guy. But He's given up the priestly role, and he's out in the middle of nowhere, and he's calling attention to himself in an inflammatory way. But his denial is emphatic. No way, no room for doubt, I am not the Christ. Okay, draw this to us for just a moment in application. We might be saying to ourselves at this point, okay, but who's going to think we're Jesus, right? That may not happen. It may not happen every day. It may not happen ever in your life. But it's not so much that people will think us Jesus. It's that oftentimes as incarnational people, they think we should behave like Jesus. Or at the very least, how they think Jesus would behave. And so in order to reflect Christ, we have to be really clear again on who we are not and who we are. And understanding that we are not the Christ means that we have to be very, very, very clear to people that we are okay with the skin 
that we are in. And I'm going to use myself as an example for this this morning. And this is part of my testimony. This is part of my story, not the how I got saved part, but how I deal with this part of who I am not. Um, by the way, no one has ever accused me of being Jesus, and that will never happen. <laughs> But what I realized the longer I've been in ministry, and it's been almost 20 years now, um, I realized that my best trait is also, maybe by many people, my worst trait. Just depends on with whom you speak. Um, that trait that I'm referring to is a very informal personality. I have a very informal personality, and that to some people is refreshing, and they say you're not like a minister, and then there's another group of people that says, that's not refreshing, and I want you a little bit more solemn, and a little bit more professional, or a little bit more austere. And, and I recognize this about myself. I recognize that the skin that I wear means that I am raw, I am flawed, I am broken, I am healed and redeemed, I am very comfortable with stating my beliefs, I'm also very, very, very comfortable with saying when I'm wrong. Um, I have at any point, at any day, the ability to tell you what I'm really, really good at and what I'm really, really bad at. And most weeks I can also tell you what God is working on in my life to craft and to make a lot better. Um, I don't play games. I don't lie, at least not very well. Ask our children. Um, I. I laugh at inappropriate things. I tell really ridiculous jokes. And it's not that I don't take uh, the holiness of Christ seriously. I just don't take myself seriously. And if you're at this point in the sermon going, why is she telling us this? Because I realize at this point in my life that this is this in-skin part that people sometimes don't always like. I remember when I was 24 years old, I was 22 when I started ministry, and when I was 24 years old, I was acutely aware that I, I, I wasn't like the other ministers. And I remember just, I couldn't wait to get that title, Reverend, because then I would be important. And then, ironically, by the time I got the title doctor at 36, I realized I wasn't important. God is important. Um, but this informal personality, my, my humor or my mess-ups or the, the times I have um, issues, that sometimes stands in contrast to what people expect Christ with skin to look like. One of the informal aspects of my personality that came under, um, made me realize this can, be, this can be a hiccup for people, was when I was teaching seminary, and I was teaching Hebrew, and I didn't use that title doctor. And I, I just thought it was more important for me to try to get at the Word of God to people who were spending three hours after a full day of work studying Hebrew. Again, some people thought that was wonderful, some people thought that was just a little too informal, and they wanted the professor to come with title and with credentials. And so you, you weigh that, and you say to yourself, what is the best way to present the Gospel? Um, I could very, very, very easily wear power suits and use $10 words and convince you that I know more than you, but that's not my personality. That's not the skin that God created. That's not the parts of me that we just read in Psalm 139 that was knitted intimately in my mother's womb. So as incarnational people, we have to be comfortable, not to the point where we become offensive to people, but we need to be comfortable with what God has created us to be. And be okay with our skin. The skin part is always going to trip people up. John the, God, John the Baptist was quirky. He was weird. He was raw. He was outside of the box and outside of mainstream. And yet, he knew that the way that God had created him to be is exactly what he should be, to draw people to him, which would draw people back to Jesus. You are not called to be anything other than what God has created you to be. So the better question for us is not who does the world want me to be, who does God want me to be? John understood that. Okay, look, two really quickly. John also said he was not Elijah. Look at the next verse. He's not Elijah. They thought he was Elijah because throughout the Old Testament, particularly in Malachi, which is about 400 years before Jesus, 
The allegory says that the, or the, the literal, depends on who you read, says that the prophet Elijah would return before the end of time, before the Son of Man. Elijah, of course, goes off into heaven. He doesn't have a physical death. He matches Elijah's physical appearance. He's rugged. He's in the wilderness. He's a little odd, kind of like Elijah was. So they assume him to be Elijah. And instead of saying, um, no, I'm not Elijah, but I'm even better, he immediately refutes that because he doesn't want people following him thinking he's Elijah 2.0. Then next up, they ask him, well, you must be the prophet. The prophet they're talking about is from Deuteronomy 18.15, when Moses says to the Israelites, God will bring you a prophet far greater than me to lead you. So they're waiting. Well, then you must be the prophet. And what does he say? Emphatically, no. He's able to shut them down and direct them from who he's not to who he is. Because he knows where he ends and where he begins. Look at where he begins. This is who he is. He says to them, he knows emphatically that he is one who is a forerunner to Jesus Christ. So if you look at um, verse 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. If you notice the parentheses, are not just around John's words. Of course, John the Apostle is quoting John the Baptist, but John the Baptist's words are not what's being focused on. It's the prophet Isaiah's words. Why is that? Because John is pointing to the fact, John the Baptist, that he is fulfilling the prophecy, but he is nothing more than one preparing for the one to come. John the Baptist, if he didn't know who he was, or if he thought himself more than he should be, he could easily have said to these guys, I am that really important voice that Isaiah is talking about. That's me looking at him in the flesh. I'm that guy. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I'm the one who's going to change the course of history because I'm going to direct you to Jesus Christ. No, he says, I am just a voice. I'm just a voice. A messenger would go out probably a mile up the road, sometimes two miles from a king, and they would tell the upcoming town the king is coming. And what that meant is that the, the town could prepare for the king by getting everything out of the road that was debris and filling in the areas of sinkhole so that the carriage or the chariot of the king could ride smoothly. John says, I know who I am. My testimony is that I'm the guy running before the chariot, getting you ready for the king. I am not the king. Then next up, he recognizes that he is to be the one to baptize the baptism of repentance. Look next. In verse 26. Um, the Pharisees, though, are a little confused at this point because they're saying to him, wait a minute. Okay, if you're not Jesus and you're not Elijah and you're not the prophet, then who gives you the right to baptize? Remember how I asked you if, what do we do when we get challenged? John's being challenged. And John the Baptist could easily get off track and spend an entire afternoon telling them why he has the right to baptize. But he doesn't. If we don't know who we are, if we don't know our calling, if we don't understand where we end and Jesus Christ begins, then it is really easy to get off track when you are challenged. It is really easy to fall to pieces when you are criticized. But when you understand who you are in Jesus Christ, you can divert it back to Jesus. Look at verse 26. He doesn't say, I have a right. Don't you know who I am? I had a special birth announcement, and I'm out here in the wilderness, and I'm the guy that Isaiah is talking about. No. What does he say? I baptize with water. He points it to Jesus, verse 26. But soon there will be one coming who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He is able to push it to Jesus because he knows he's got nothing to prove. Jesus is the king that's coming. And then just real quickly, this little weird part at the end of our section, verse 28. It says, this all happens at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. That may mean nothing, but there is no Bethany by the Jordan. What is that? Some people think it's a translational error. It's supposed to be Bethbara. Okay, maybe. There is a Bethbara by the Jordan. Bethany, if you remember, is where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Bethany's by Jerusalem. It's not by the Jordan. But how interesting is this then? John 
is baptizing at Bethany by the Jordan, what John the Apostle is doing is differentiating. John the Baptist, Baptist is where he was supposed to be to point people doing what he's supposed to be doing to Jesus, and then Jesus will be at that other Bethany later, doing what he's supposed to be doing by raising the dead, pointing people back to God. John knows that line of demarcation, where he ends and Christ begins. Okay, bring it to us. If we're going to be incarnational people, as I said last week, we have to have a posture of humility. And John will end that little section on Jesus baptizing with the words, I'm not fit to untie his sandals. A rabbi, a very famous rabbi, said years ago in his commentary that a teacher, a master, can teach us all things, but a student knows their place when they are unfit to tie, untie their master's shoes. John the Baptist has this posture of humility. If we're going to be incarnational people, then we need to come before the Lord with that posture of humility. We need to come before each other with that posture of humility. And here's the thing. The world will give you every opportunity to shine. But it is not important that the world thinks we're important. It's important that the world thinks that Jesus is important. And so part of making room for the incarnation is sometimes we've got to get out of our own way so that people can see Jesus and not us. And the other thing about making room for the incarnation and us being incarnational is that when we know who we are, we know what we're not called to do. We can walk beside people in pain. We can walk beside people who are hurting and not get sucked up in it because we don't change them. We don't save them. We just walk beside them. We can minister to people and preach to people and teach to people and evangelize to people and not feel like failures when they don't convert because guess what? We don't change them. We are not the light. We just point people to the light. As incarnational people, when we understand where we end and Christ begins, then we're able to reflect Jesus to other people. So here's that challenge to you today. I'm going to give you a little homework. Um, last week I said to you, we need to be okay with being weird. And I'm going to unpack that for you for just a second. When we tell our stories, the um, how I got saved part, the ordinary, everyday, mundane part, the oh my goodness, you've got to see what the Lord is doing in my life part, the spectacular spiritual growth part, all of that, that is our story, is the important part to tell, but it is a language that is often very unfamiliar in our world. And no, we do not need to approach anybody with the phrase, you brood of vipers. But when we start saying things like, I need to pray about it, or God's calling me to do this, or I'm not sure if it fits what the Lord has in mind for me, that is as disarming and uncomfortable for our world as John the Baptist was for his. It's weird. And we've got to be okay with that kind of language. So your homework this week is to ask God, how do I tell my story? Ask yourself, do I tell my story? And I think one that's really been a challenge to me is, does my story change depending on who I'm with? Do I have one story I might tell my, my church friends? And another story I might promote to my work friends? And another story I might promote to to everybody else around me. And if that's the case, check in with God. God, what's this about? Why am I uncomfortable? How can you run before me and make me comfortable with the Holy Spirit? Our stories are important. Our testimonies are what point people to Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we go before your table in a moment, allow us to spend this time of silence and confession and in awareness that you have searched us, O oh Lord. Amen.
We're going to come forward in just a moment for communion. Once again, we invite everybody, regardless of your membership with our church, um, we ask that there's a, a belief in Jesus Christ, and that is between you and the Lord. Um, and it's also okay to not take communion. To say, right now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, and I, I'm going to sit this one out. That's, that's, that's your call, too. We're going to come forward in a moment. We're going to ask that you take it back to your seat. We'll take communion together at the end. If you cannot come forward, we'll have it brought to you. I'm going to have the deacons come forward. to the people.
he sang already, that wonderful line from My Worth is Not in What I Own, that says, Two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness. As you come before Christ on the table, we are holding those two things in tension, that we are both children of God who are born sinful, and yet we are children of God that he loves so much, he considered us worthy enough to die for us. On the night when Christ was crucified, he took the cup, he took the bread, he said, this is my body that is broken for you, this is a cup, a new covenant poured out for you. We take today in remembrance of him. Gracious Lord, take us out now into your world as your children, pointing people to you as the light we pray. Amen. <laughs> 